Welcome to Shooting Straight with A1F.com. Our guest is John Lott. John burst onto the scene in 1998 with his book, More Guns, Less Crime. And he's written a lot of must-reads since. He's a renowned economist and a former professor who has taught at the University of Chicago, at Yale, and at other esteemed universities. He is the founder and CEO of the Crime Prevention Research Center, an important nonprofit you can find at crimeresearch.org. Today we're going to talk about his short stint at the U.S. Department of Justice. Last October, John joined the Trump administration as a senior advisor for research and statistics in the Office of Justice Programs, a department that doles out billions of dollars each year, some to academics who actively work against our Second Amendment rights. John left just before President Joe Biden was sworn into office. He also left after a group of anti-gun senators had publicly demanded to know what he was up to in the Department of Justice. So, John, tell us about it. What were you up to in the Department of Justice? Oh, I don't know. Lots of things. They, they, uh, they, the senators, the, all the nine Democrats on the Senate Judiciary Committee also wanted to, demanded to know how I could be hired. How, how the Department of Justice could hire somebody who was known uh, to have my views on gun control issues. Um, well, you're only the most renowned researcher today on these issues. Um, why should you be hired? But why did you want to go there in the first place? Well, you know, I guess when you're asked to go and help out in the government, uh, you feel some obligation to do it. I guess I was also hoping that there was a chance that uh, there might be a second Trump term. And being in there, being on the ground floor, uh, there are a lot of things I wanted to get done. I wouldn't have probably moved across country or been as eager to move across country if I was sure that it was only going to be for a few months. I mean, it's kind of costly to move across country. Well, what was the problem, though? What did you want to go in there and solve? Why? I remember we were speaking about this, and you told me that you were complaining to the Trump administration about certain allocations of funds for certain grants. Um, and they couldn't make a heads or tails of it until they finally said, well, John, why don't you go in and do something? Well, what was that about? Yeah, well, I mean, it's not like they said, why don't you come in and do something about it? I, I uh, you know, it was a chance to go and be able to go and look at data that I wouldn't be able to get access to, or at least the hope that I'd be able to look at data that I wouldn't be able to get access to. And, uh, and also, uh, you know, help with policy a little bit. But um, you know, so I'll give you an example. One thing I tried to do when I got there, and that is, uh, you know, I've long been concerned about the problems with the NICS background check system. Uh, I'm sure in the coming weeks, we're going to be hearing over and over again that there are 3.5 million dangerous prohibited people that have been stopped from buying guns because of background checks. And you know, as well as I do, that that's simply false. What they should say is that there have been 3.5 million initial denials, and that virtually all of those are mistakes. I mean, it's one thing to stop a felon from buying a gun. It's another thing to stop somebody simply because they've been named similar to a felon from buying a gun. And the problem is it's pr primarily the most vulnerable people in our society who are discriminated against by this. So people tend to have names similar to their racial groups. Hispanics have names similar to other Hispanics. Blacks have names similar to other blacks. When you fill out the 4473 and you put down your name, your social security number, your address, your birthday, your race, your eye color, you know, you think, you hope they're using all that information. And what they frequently use is roughly phonetically similar names and similar birthdays. And the problem is, that creates a lot of mistakes, <clears throat> and it primarily creates mistakes for minority males. So 34% of black males in the United States are legally prohibited from owning a gun simply because they're felons. Well, whose names are their names most likely to be confused with? Other black males. And so one thing I did when I got there was I wanted to get the precise data, uh, recent data on that stuff. And so... I went to the people at the Bureau of Justice Statistics, convinced them that uh, we should put that together. They agreed. Uh, and then they approached the FBI, which has that data. And the FBI came back and they said, you know, this isn't interesting. There's really no reason to look at this. We're not really clear why you would want to look at this. And so um, we pushed back. 
and tried to explain why it was interesting. And they insisted that it wasn't an interesting question. You're trying to target the problem. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't that be interesting to our premier law enforcement agency? That, that's insane. I mean, we can go into that more in a minute, but let me just kind of... Uh, and so, anyway, um, uh, they disappeared for about four weeks, five weeks. And then uh, two days after the election, they came back and they said, all right, uh, you have to fill out a FOIA request, a Freedom of Information Act request. I mean, this is, we're, we're all in the Department of Justice, okay? The Department of Justice uh, oversees the FBI, right? And uh, uh, the Bureau of Justice Statistics, which regularly gets data from the FBI, was asking for data from the FBI, and nobody had ever heard of them demanding previously that you had to do a FOIA request. I mean, this is something that you as a, you know, a media person would go and ask for. This is not something that somebody in the <laughs> Department of Justice asks for something from somebody else in the Department of Justice. So anyway, um, uh, and they also said, uh, well, um, we're not going to be able to get to this until after January 20th. And uh, we don't really believe that the Biden administration is going to be very interested in this data, basically indicating to us that there's really no reason to try to go and uh, even bother filling out the FOIA request on this. So this is FBI Nix playing politics immediately, seeing the next administration coming. Right. I mean, it's just bizarre. I, look, I've worked in Washington twice now. Uh, I worked in the 1980s and, I, and this past year and beginning of January. And, uh, you know, both times the vast majority of civil service people are Democrats. I mean, there's just no two ways about it. The difference is now, uh, I actually, when I get into discussions with some people, they would tell me they were Democrats. You know, I would go, and the point of this is what? I mean, it's one thing to go and say you're All right, wrong. Let, let's define that for a second. Let's just say Democrats, because we're, we're talking about something else. Yeah, Democrats, Republicans, okay, the partisan divide. But we're talking about partisan Democrats, people who, that are willing to even change data or not give data or play politics with data um, because of their political yeah, affiliation, not just because they happen just, to be a Democrat. I'm just talking about even just general discussions with them. You right. say something, and they say, well, they're a Democrat. I go like, and that's an answer to my point, how exactly? You know, if you have some issue that you're raising and trying to talk to them about, I mean, who cares? I mean, is my point right or wrong? You know, do they have a response? Do they have a logical issue? Telling me what their political affiliation is is just like completely irrelevant to Nick's the Nick's supposed to be keeping guns out of the hands of bad guys. That's the idea. I, I'm, just, I'm not even referring to Nick's right there. I'm just okay. saying as a general point. And, uh, <clears throat> But, um, uh, you know, uh, to me, the Nix system, to get back on that, is, you know, it's important. I mean, if you have three and a half million mistakes being made, I mean, you know you can go and hire a lawyer. Most people, if you have a mistake with the Nix system and uh, they're falsely flagging you, uh, you know, in theory, you can handle it yourself. But the vast majority of people are going to find it necessary to go and hire a lawyer to help them with that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you just, uh, it's like $3,000 on up, $3,000. I've heard $10,000 for some of these cases. So what you have is a system where through no fault of the individuals themselves, law-abiding citizens, particularly minority males, are being denied being able to go and purchase a gun and then being asked if it, it, to fix it to have to spend thousands of dollars of their own money to fix the problem. There's no reason why that should be the case. Look, if private companies, had, when they do background checks on employees, had an error rate that was 100th, the error rate that the federal government has in doing mixed background checks, they would be sued out of existence under federal law. And I, for 20 years, I've been going to gun control advocates and say, look, you could get these universal background checks pass that you claim are so important if you just made a couple changes. Uh, one of the changes is uh, to get rid of the false positives. And there's a simple way to do that. All you have to do 
is have the federal government have to meet the same standards for doing background checks that private companies have to use. That means use all the information that's available the way it exists. And, uh, you know, but they will fight you tooth and nail. When I, when they had the fix Nix bill a few years ago, I uh, had talked to some senator's staff to try to get them to put up an amendment. I mean, they we're talking about fix Nix, okay? That's the whole name of the bill. Mm-hmm. Why not put up an amendment that would require uh, that the federal government uh, fix these mistakes that are there? If the, almost everybody who gets stopped is a mistake, that's not right. And, and yet the Democrats, my understanding, I wasn't involved directly in those conversations, but I was told the Democrats said, if you try to put up this amendment, uh, we're going to view it as a poison pill and we'll blame the Republicans for scuttling the fix Nix bill. How is, how is requiring that the, uh, that the Nix background check system has to meet the same requirements for doing a background check that the federal government thinks is great for private companies. Uh, how is that a poison pill? But uh, well, Also to step back a second, if you have to hire an attorney, if your, your name is flagged on Nix, and you have to hire an attorney to go and, and resolve that issue with the FBI and spend that kind of money, you disenfranchise the poor, the people who can't afford that. Exactly. Poor and middle class. I, I may like to own a gun, but even if I'm middle income uh, or even higher, that doesn't mean I want to spend $3,000 or more to be able to go and own a gun. I mean, I may value it, but do I value it 3,000? Do I value it in 10,000? How much, how, you know, and you have the same type of thing occurring these days with these red flag laws. Um, uh, virtually all these red flag laws don't provide uh, legal counsel for people. And, uh, you know, I've talked to lawyers. They say, well, you know, uh, defense in these cases can be about $10,000. Well, I may really value owning a gun. But if the government comes in and takes my gun uh, and, you know, we have a hearing 30 days later, uh, do I want to have a lawyer? Do I want to spend $10,000? And it looks like the vast majority of people that go through these red flag law cases do not have a lawyer with them. Well, guess what? If you don't have a lawyer with you and you're everybody else in the room that's kind of arguing the case is a lawyer, you're going to be at a real disadvantage that's there. And so, uh, you know, people are going to lose just because they're not willing to spend $10,000 uh, on their case. Does that mean that they don't want to own a gun? Does that mean that they're really not capable of owning a gun? No, it means that they're not willing to spend ten thousand uh, dollars to be able to have the ability to own a gun for protection. Right, all because of somebody who might be anti-gun, might even be an activist themselves, had decided to flag you and report you to take your Second Amendment rights away. Um, you have to go to court then and spend all this money to try to get them back because somebody has an agenda. And it, well, it could be, you know, maybe they're meaning too. Maybe they're well-meaning individuals. But, you know, I have a, uh, the executive director for the Crime Prevention Research Center, uh, uh, Nikki Gozer, uh, went through something that I think, you know, gives me concerns about the way uh, the red flag laws would work. So, you know the story. Her husband was murdered in front of her in a gun-free zone. Uh, by a stalker. Uh, She was, understandably, as anybody would be, extremely depressed for a long period of time afterwards. Now, what happens if uh, a friend or a neighbor or a relative uh, were to say, you know, Nikki is very depressed. Uh, She has a gun. Uh, I'm concerned about her there. And so out of well-meaningness, they go and, uh, and they report her. Um, well, uh, you know, in her case, it would make the situation much worse because she just had a stalker murder her husband, uh, or she just saw a stalker murder her husband in front of her. And what, uh, uh, you know, what's she going to do at that point? Right, that monster was writing her pr- letters from prison, if I recall, um, threatening to come and find her and so on. Well, he's, yeah, he's got sentenced to prison. Uh, but he's been writing her love letters from right. prison. I mean, this guy, 
He's been in jail for a decade more, and and uh, it, apparently he's still obsessed with her. Uh, and so she's concerned about him being released from prison. But but the point that I was getting to was that what does that do to your willingness to go and talk to other people about how you feel about being depressed? If you're worried that somebody who's well-meaning might say, look, uh, uh, she's depressed. Uh, this, uh, understandably, this guy killed her husband, but she has a gun uh, and reports that she's going to be reticent to go and talk to people about uh, her depression. Now, is Including that professional help. Right. Right. Is that good that people who are depressed will be reticent to go and talk to people? I mean, just simply talking to people can be very helpful. Uh, how about police officers? Police officers, we know, tend to be more depressed than the general population. Understandably, they see a lot of bad things that happen out there in the world. Uh, do we want police officers to be wary to go and talk to people about their feelings? I mean, if a police officer talks to somebody, let's say a friend or a relative or a neighbor, and, uh, and has his gun taken away, that's the same thing as taking away his job. Do we want police officers to be afraid to share their feelings with other people? Uh, but let's get back to the Department of Justice and your work. But it excited me that when you were going to work there for, for it turned out to be a short stint, unfortunately, um, was, was that the, the research that's funded in places like that goes into academia and academic does the research. That research then gets made public. The mainstream media picks that up, uh, many of which are anti-gun, and they spin those numbers even more and put those out in a propagandic effect that then affects public opinion. It's all, it's a cycle, uh, funding that kind of research, which... Bloomberg has done this for years. It's the reason why he spends hundreds of millions of dollars financing research, because he knows when he gets studies put out, the media will uncritically cite the studies. Uh, you know, this year, uh, the CDC is something like $25 million to go and fund uh, gun research. Well, you know what the public health people are going to do. I have a, a book, uh, The War on Guns, which kind of goes through a lot of the public health people claims and how poorly done uh, their research is. Uh, you have places like the RAND Corporation, which has like apparently maybe up to $50 million now to go and give out. Uh, to finance uh, gun control but, but research. Those, those are large, wealthy people and nonprofits, Bloomberg and so on. The Fed, when the federal government is doing it, I think it, it bothers me just that much more. Oh, sure. Well, um, it's your so, money. So it's you, you money. were in the bowels there at the Department of Justice, ha having seen it and seen the process and how it works. What can we do to fix this? What can we do to at least shine sunlight on where this money is being spent? Well, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean... To be honest, I don't think the federal government should be giving out any money on this or other things because I don't think that they can divorce uh, politics from uh, who they give the money out to. Um, but, uh, you know, I was uh, I gave comments on the firearm solicitation uh, that the National Institute of Justice was putting out. And, you know, just the civil service people there. I don't even know if they realize how biased they are on things. Uh, I'll give you one sentence uh, that was in the solicitation. It was saying they wanted to find research that would study uh, the benefits of waiting periods and the elimination of or the institution of gun free zones in reducing firearm homicides. So just the benefits. And, huh? OK, right. I, and I was I uh, wrote back and I said, you know, um, why not put increase or why not put increase or decrease in there? And uh, the response I got back is, well, you know, you're just biased, John. And I said, well, you know, I look at this each year. You guys keep on talking about looking at the benefits of these things. Uh, that seems pretty biased to me. Why not increased or decreased? And the, I, the response I got back was, well, uh, this, the civil service people who are working on this uh, will get very upset. Uh, and I said, look, if they got upset about me putting an increase or decrease, I would just say, fine, let's just put an increase there. And uh, that would be my response to them uh, on it. How is it scientific research if there's a predetermined conclusion, which is what you're getting at here? It's the reason why the government shouldn't be funding this stuff, because the mm -hmm. people who make the decisions on what 
should be funded have strong views on these things. Um, you know, unfortunately, uh, the money that was given out even during the Trump administration, the people who were giving this out basically gave all their money to gun control advocates. Uh, you, I think you know who Garen Wintemute is. Uh, he's uh, at the University of California, Davis. His group gets something like $10 million a year from the state of California uh, for firearms research. There's a reason why the state of California gives him the money. Uh, because of his strong political views on the issue. Uh, the Department of Justice gave him and his group something like $1.7 million. Uh, you know, it's just crazy. How did that approval process happen within that I department? Was around there at the time, I just know that the mm -hmm. outcome that was there. Um, but, you know, he's not the only one. I, you know, probably other people, people are less well known. Uh, but, you know, it's just, um, unfortunately, there's going to be a lot more money, and it's going to be uh, just as bad uh, in the coming years here. And as you say, uh, what's going to happen is they're going to produce research, and they're going to make claims, and it's going to get completely uncritical media coverage. You know, I don't even know how people spend that amount of money. Our budget at the Crime Prevention Research Center is a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, uh, you know. $1.8 million. I mean, that would be unbelievable to have that much money. Uh, you know, I'd be, I'd be fall off my chair if I would got uh, a third of that. Well, have you ever put in for a grant? Uh, I haven't put in grant right now. Actually, since I worked in the department of justice, I'm banned for a year from putting in, right. uh, uh, applications. But before for that, you never did. I didn't, mainly because I guess I just thought the process was so politically biased that it wasn't really, didn't really make much sense. I, even when I was an academic at Chicago or Yale, I never really bothered to put in applications for the money. Uh, there are plenty of people who did. Um, you know, my way of doing the research was just to pay for it out of my own pocket. Uh, sometimes what I would do with graduate students, I would say, you know, like my paper with David Mustard on concealed carry. I went to David and I said, look, you have two options. Either one, I can pay you, <laughs> or two, uh, we can work on this paper together, okay? And you'll get a co-authored paper out of it. And uh, he you know, wanted to be successful in academia and he thought getting a paper was much more valuable than, uh, than uh, uh, getting paid to go and spend the hours to go and do research. So. Uh, I did that. But I mean, when I was, you know, to places at Chicago or Wharton or Yale or whatever, I would pay for, you know, thousands of dollars each year out of my own pocket for uh, research. I, I would urge you to, to put in just for the just for the media. I mean, I would certainly write about it at America's First Freedom. Um, and, I, and I bet you other places would pick it up and talk about it if the, the gun control crowd is getting our public money. Uh, and, and a place like your crime prevention research center is not uh, with all the, the valuable research you're doing. It's a costly process right. to go through and and do that. If I was at a university, you know, you have whole support staff mm -hmm. to go do that. You know, do I really want to spend a month just going through and getting the forms together and stuff like that? You know, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess mm. you could get a news story out of it and you'd cover it. But I I mean, I'm happy to talk to you about it off air. But it's just I have I, you know, I have only so much time in the day. And if I spent like a solid month going and dealing with that, I'm not sure I'd accomplish a mm. lot. In fact, I can even be more. I mean, that's just plus there's the time putting the grant together and stuff. So right. it just. Um, you know, so that's basically been my attitude, but and look, I'm happy to talk to you about it. Right. Do, do you know who, who's taking over the department now? I don't know. I don't, yeah. my guests, uh, uh, the National Institute of Justice director position hasn't been nominated yet. Right. It's not a, it's not a, a, a an appointment that requires confirmation. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, so, you know, my guess is it'll probably be filled fairly quickly. 
Uh, but it hasn't been filled yet, I don't think. I don't know. I haven't looked. Right. Well, when, when I saw a group, I think it was nine senators writing that public letter asking for, for records and, and why are you hired and, and so on, um, I submitted a FOIA request um, to find out why are you hired, what you were doing, and, and so on. Um, and as, as I understand, the Trace, which is Bloomberg's group from every town, the, the anti-gun group, also filed a FOIA request, Freedom of Information Act request. Um, they got materials a lot sooner than I did, and I had to complain to get some materials out of them, and just publicly by what they've made public um, it, within their publication. Um, I know they got records that I haven't yet gotten. Um, so this is politics that's being played right now just with the, your tenure there, just why you were hired and what you were doing there, um, which upsets me now hearing what you have to tell me about that program and how little we can do about it despite the $5 billion, and I know it doesn't all go to gun stuff, but $5 billion through that program annually. Um, it's, it's disturbing and upsetting. I, I don't know what we can possibly do about it to clean this up and to, to put some sunlight on this. Yeah. Uh, so a question you asked earlier that I asked to put off a little bit was kind of what's the motivation for why people are doing these types of things. And, uh, you know, uh, Look at something like uh, the FBI spying on a presidential campaign for an opposing party, okay? Uh, you figure, how did they do this without having any leaks, without having any whistleblowers occurring there? And the way, reason why they had that was because Comey and Strzok and McCabe and everybody else who was involved in it all had the same left-wing political views on the world. And uh, the problem is, it's not just at the top. Uh, you know, I don't know about all the places in the Department of Justice or the FBI, but I know, uh, at least in the data people, I was, had the very strong belief that that type of political corruption uh, exists with the data people that are there. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, and unfortunately, it's not just in the Department of Justice. I have, uh, friends that I knew who were working in the Department of Defense. Uh, you may remember back in like 2011 in the, uh, uh, in the Obama administration, they fired at one time something like 125 generals. Uh, from what I'm told, the one common feature for those generals were that they were Republicans. And uh, <clears throat> that year, I guess they ended up firing like 175 or something like that. It was a record number of uh, people there. Some they had reasons saying the person was didn't do his job right or incompetent or dereliction of duty. But others, they didn't even list what the reason was uh, that they were being removed. And, uh, and I think you see that across a lot of the government, that you're in a situation uh, now, Trump, if Trump had gone through and removed people from the FBI or, uh, you know, going down or people in the Department of Defense or other places based on their political views, uh, you know, the media would have gone completely nuts. But um, uh, we're in a situation right now where uh, you have open partisans just completely dominate uh, the government that's there. And it's pretty scary. You ask what to do about it. I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, you have to basically get rid of civil service protections and, and clear out the place. I suppose it's one <coughs> reason not to have civil service protections because, uh, you know, civil service protections are supposed to make it so that uh, the civil service is nonpartisan. But, you know, we're way past that. But that's a bigger and, and deeper discussion. Um, I guess I would just like to see as a journalist, I'd like to see some light on these grants and, and how they're being allocated. And if I put in a FOIA request, which I have done, um, I'd actually like to see the documents that my public money is going to. So much of it's subjective on what's an mm -hmm. interesting grant or whether you think the person will do a good job or not. Right. Uh, I mean, you can go and look at it and you'll see, you know, you'll see, well, all these individuals that got money basically have a track record of being pro gun control or something like that, or they've made public statements and they'll just say, well, you know, these were the best grants right. applications that we got. Right. And then what do you do with the story on that? I mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe that's a story, but my guess is the vast majority of the media isn't going to care about, uh, no, they're not. Right. about that. No, the best uh, you can do is add it up and show that 
either all or most of the money is going a certain ideological direction. Right, and you'll you'll put it out. I mean, I can send you spreadsheets for basically the breakdown I had uh, before I got there, looking at grants and stuff. But it's uh, I don't know. <laughs> I wish. Well, this is a freedom issue, John. That's what drives me crazy. Here, this isn't a Democrat or Republican issue. It's a basic constitutional right, it's a civil liberty um, that used to be that both parties, to, to some extent, supported. Um, but it's become a partisan issue, unfortunately. And I, I don't talk about it in those terms because I, I don't see it in those terms. And I know a lot of Democrats who are pro-gun. And a lot of them have bought guns over the last year. Um, so I, I see hope of it swinging back. Um, but when it comes to this money, um, I, don't, I guess just keep pushing. I, I, I don't I see a solution. I think the only solution you have is to have the government not fund this stuff. Right. Uh, <clears throat> that the government should just stay out of it. So. Well. But. Well, thank you for going there, John, and going into the bowels and doing what you did. Um, certainly appreciate it. Um, we'll keep in touch and you hope being you'll come there. back. I've known you for a long time, and I appreciate you having me on. Thanks very much. My pleasure, John.